and then the environment was cleaned up. First time I was hearing about this stuff. Wow. It was totally new to me. And then with social impact consulting. Hello everyone. My name is Efwa Ellens Ede with Social Impact Consulting. I'm a development consultant with 20 years of experience working with NGOs, international NGOs, and bilateral agencies to work in project support, monitoring and evaluation, and civil society strengthening. So now, I saw that local NGOs lack the capacity to manage large-scale projects which can in turn impact their various communities because they have the connection based on their backgrounds. So this made me create this channel so that I can add value to you for free once you subscribe to this channel and get notified of upcoming videos. I look forward to hearing from you. Hello, hello everyone. How are you doing today? You are most welcome to the Development Sector Series, which is Dev Sector Series. So this is such a good time to have you guys here on today. Okay, so let me know where you're watching from so that I can thank you personally in the comments. And also want to give a shout out to those who will be watching afterwards. Thank you so much for your support. Follow and connect with me on all my social media handles for future updates. If you have any questions about the discussion in this program, you know, just um, put the questions in the comments and we're going to be asking our uh, special guest today after um, the interview session. So make sure you include your questions, okay? So today we're going to be having conversations um, with our guest today, Dr. Kole Shetima. He is the director of the MacArthur Foundation, Nigeria. We're going to be talking today, the fight against the big C, corruption. Dr. Kole Shetima is a passionate development practitioner and has mentored several um, professionals. And uh, I'm just at the back of the line in one of his mentees in his career. MacArthur Foundation is one of the major private philanthropic organizations in Nigeria. Since 2015, the foundation has supported organizations with $89.3 million, okay? And one of their main strategic mandates is the fight against corruption and social justice. So we're going to have an exciting conversation today because um, in my career, especially here in Nigeria, I've watched advocacy um, organizations thrive in demanding accountability from state and non-state actors with the support of the MacArthur Foundation. So right now I am going to play his video bio and then we are going to get started. Is the director of the MacArthur Foundation's Africa office in Abuja, Nigeria. He is responsible for grant making in the population and reproductive health area, human rights and international justice and the partnership for higher education in Africa. Prior to joining the foundation in 1999, Shatima taught at the University of Meduguri, the University of Toronto and at Ohio State University. He was state coordinator and national education coordinator for Women of Nigeria, Coordinator of Working Group on Nigeria Toronto, and Co-Chair of the Economic Justice Working Group of the Interchurch Coalition on Africa Toronto. Shatima is also on the board of several organizations, including the Center for Democracy and Development. He has published in several academic journals, including Africa Development, and Review of Africa Political Economy, Africa Studies Review, and Journal of Asian and Africa Studies. Dr. Kole Shetima 
has a PhD from the University of Toronto, a master's degree from Mamadou Belou University in Zaria, and his undergraduate degree from the University of Meiduguri, and where he has also been a faculty member. Allow me to introduce to some and present to others Dr. Kole Shetima. Good afternoon, Dr. Kole. How are you? I am very well, Efwa. Good morning, good morning, good morning. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for uh, taking time of your, out of your extremely busy schedule. Um, so I just wanted to make a quick announcement. For those of you on LinkedIn, it looks like on LinkedIn's end, there are issues with the streaming service. And please excuse the, the banging. There's a bit of maintenance going on. So please bear with us as well. I think there's, there's some issues with LinkedIn in the streaming. But as soon as they sort it out, it will be streaming again. Otherwise, what I'll do is I'll share the broadcast on LinkedIn separately. So again, thank you so much, Dr. Kole, for coming. Thank you very much for having me as well. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, when I posted it on, on social media, I mean, people have been excited about this conversation. So let's get started. Mm. So, mm. Um, so just... As we know, um, the MacArthur Foundation has one of its uh, uh, focus in, Niger in Nigeria is uh, the anti-corruption movement, not just with civil society organizations, with the government sector as well. But I wanted to just ask a macro question. How has corruption itself affected national development in Nigeria and other developing countries? Significantly, significantly. I, I think I recently read uh, someone making the point that um, probably corruption has caused more lives than civil wars in Africa. Um, I think that, you know, in war situations, of course, we see the people being killed directly here and there. Um, but, you know, in terms of the impact of corruption on the quality of lives of our people, we don't see that directly. So people really do not comprehend what it means, what corruption has done to our people and our things. In fact, I will also add that, you know, some of the actual causes of civil war in our continent may not be related to the high level of endemic corruption that we, we will have. People feel frustrated, people feel marginalized, they don't have any hope in life, and therefore for them to fight in order for them to get what they feel they're entitled to is just a way of life of expressing their own uh, frustration and things. So I think that, you know, if you look at the um, amount of resources that have been spent in our country and in the continent, but you then see that, you know, the high level of, you know, uh, endemic problems of poverty, endemic problems of road accidents, or mothers going to the hospital, but they are, don't have access to basic health services, of our children who should be in school, or people who are going into school, but the school has not passed through them, they basically enter as illiterate, they come about illiterate, they feel alienated, they don't understand why their own children or they are not given the same opportunities and the benefits that other children of the wealthy and the rich people get. They feel alienated and other things, and therefore they can, they take recourse to violence uh, to express themselves um, because they don't see how they are citizens of the country, but they are not entitled they are not given the right to enjoy the same services as it. Not because those resources are not available, but because one person somewhere have decided to corner and, and, and put in their own pockets the resources that should have gone into providing the education of the children, to providing the water for children, to provide sanitation for children, the roads that should have been built so that we don't have terrible road accidents that happen in our countries and places. Um, the mothers that die because someone who have been given the opportunity to provide uh, basic, uh, you know, uh, medication for, let's say, hemorrhage or for eclampsia and other things, uh, the woman will die because someone has decided to put the money in their pocket and that woman do not have access to those resources and therefore she will die because somebody else have done. So I think that the impact of corruption on our daily lives is so significant. Sometimes, you know, they, they, they sound little, 
uh, in certain ways, you know, you drive from, let's say, from Abuja to to Enugu, uh, you see the 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 the, the road. The, the, the checking points whereby you have to drop something in order for you to do that one. There was a study, I believe it was by ICIR, was talking about you know try, trying to, uh, to, to uh, take a, 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 a truck from, I think it was from Jalingo in Taraba State to Port Harcourt and on average they, they have to spend like 450,000 Naira 450,000 Naira in order just to to take a, a, a truck from Jalingo to Port Harcourt. Now, that money wow. you know, could have used that one for to do any other things in order to improve the quality of their lives. But what happens, it ends up in the pockets of very few people, and that deprives the country of the resources that are meant to be there. And we have also seen all the big problems our country you know we always talk about Jokoto. every government have been talking about Jokoto steel mill from shagari to uh, buhari and it looks like you know it never comes to an end we are talking about the same thing all over and all over you know talking about how that has deprived the nation of the steel and uh, and and the, in the basic industrial needs in order for our country to develop and other things so you can uh, you cross over all parts of the country we talk about second mainland bridge um I think that people are probably now at this point they have stopped they don't want to even talk about it they just don't want to see it because it's something that we have been talking about for the last 30 40 years you know it's west road we have been talking about it for the last the 20 years so nobody really is interested in whether it is there or you know whatever just people want to see it and other things and you know and those are basic infrastructure that can significantly improve the quality of our trading the quality of the services that our people can get and other things but unfortunately every government seems to be just interested in awarding the contract but nobody seems to be interested in sending the end of how these roads and how this infrastructure and how these health facilities and other things are being provided for and and i think that that, that i think arguably the most important problem of nigeria is corruption because you know whether it is even corruption in terms of jobs and others a lot of young people do not now believe that they can actually apply for any job anywhere in the country whether the federal level or the state level or even in local government uh, even, even, even among our own uh, civil society groups and organizations unless they know somebody unless they know somebody somewhere they do not believe that they can actually fairly get a job anywhere in the country so the level of corruption that how it has alienated our young people and has made our young people becoming more and more looking for ways of expressing themselves than rather than the regular ways and other things because people apply for jobs apply for they apply for 20 times nobody even acknowledges that they have even applied and other things what what else do you expect them to do so they turn into all kinds of things in order for them to express themselves so for me i think that if there is one problem that has um, that has really, really, if there is one problem that we can say fundamental to the challenges of Nigeria is the endemic corruption that our people are facing. And we have to work very, very, very hard in order to ensure that we reduce it to the minimum level. I'm not saying that we can eradicate it. No, I don't think that you can eradicate corruption. But I think that we should reduce it significantly so that our people can get the basic needs of their lives. The country may not be as rich as other countries, but I believe that our country has the resources to provide the minimum basic needs of our citizens so that our citizens or Nigerians can feel that they are Nigerians. And they are Nigerians because they can get some basic education, they can get some basic health services, they can get some sense of safety in their place and other things. Because without those ones, I don't see how we as people can really feel like we're Nigerians. Really, you've you've talked you've talked about um, corruption on so many levels in terms of infrastructure and uh, in fact human capital development with regards to youth. Now we, we we've now seen on a macro level that there is an issue with corruption. So now um, I, I'm heading the helm with the Makata Foundation here in Africa. What um, you you must have been part of that strategy of making sure that that. Corruption is part of the strategy. What 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 made the foundation itself make anti-corruption part of its strategy? Well, I think that is because of what I said. You know, we sat down and said, look, 
how much money does Makasa has in this country? Well, uh, you know, maybe we have uh, 5 million, 10 million, 20 million, even if we have 100 million, for example, how many roads can we build? How exactly. many hospitals can we provide? How many schools can we build? How many of those things we can do? We said, look, given the resources that we have, probably one of the contributions that we can make is how do we contribute towards ensuring that government spend the resources that are meant to be spent? We are not asking any big question. Government makes a budget at the federal government level, at the state level, at the local government. All we are asking is, can you spend the money that you have budgeted for according to your own budget that you have set? So we are not even asking questions about, is that the right you know, money? Is not the wrong money? No, it's not even that one. You have already made your own budget. Can you spend the resources that you have according to what you have said? Simple. So, and we believe that if we are able to spend the resources of our country according to what we have said we are going to do, then that itself may be a bigger contribution to the country than the money that MacArthur Foundation is able to put into either road or into electricity or into um, water supply or into sanitation or any of those things that are also, all of them are very important. All of these are very important. All these are very important. But I think that enabling government to spend its own resources effectively and efficiently is probably a better strategy, at least from our own perspective. The same thing with the private sector. The private sector also, you know, their own contribution to corruption is also very, very significant because professionals, for example, whether they are lawyers, whether they are bankers, whether they are auditors, uh, or whatever kind of work they do, you know, as a professional, as a as, as a banker, as a lawyer, as an auditor, as an accountant, how am I ensuring that I do my own work according to my own professional ethics? If I do my own work according to professional ethics, I will also help to provide the services for our own people. So that is why we think supporting how federal, how the government does its work, but supporting how professionals in the private sector also do their own work, so that the monies that are supposed to be meant for are not hidden by accountants who are very, very clever, or by auditors who are very, very clever, or by lawyers who uh, accelerate and facilitate the level of corruption that happens in our society. So for us, I think it's a question of what is the best use of our resources? Is it easier and better for us to use it in order to build the schools and the clinics and the roads, which obviously we cannot do that one? Or is it easier and better for us to see how can we help to ensure that what is meant for Nigeria is actually spent in and for Nigeria? That's that's a really um, interesting way to put it um, and uh, a good use um, of resources. So we're going to go into the next question, sir. So. Um, I just wanted to, you to just talk a little bit about some of the successful projects that you have, the foundation has supported with regards to anti-corruption and uh, its impact so far. So, you know, some of the impact, as I tell people sometimes, is not the big stories, really, sometimes, you know. So, for example, you know, when we used to su support the, the feeding program, you know, you go to a school. And you see these children who probably have not eaten at home, okay, coming to school. They are struggling <laughs> to get egg and bread, you know, and, and it, maybe if they are lucky that they may be um, orange. And you see them struggling to get that, something that, you know, for many people, of us who are in middle class and upper class, we take it for granted. But for those children who are getting these things, it's a lot of, it's, 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 it means so much to them. And so you see these small children smiling, you know, rushing to get this one. And some of them actually even put it in their pocket because they want to take it to their own siblings at home. Who could not come in straight to them? So when you see the joy and you see the expression in the faces of those children, it means a lot to them 
and it also means a lot to us, those who are, those who are watching the MacArthur Foundation, because we can see the direct implications. So this this debate and conversation about anti-corruption, I tell people that it's not some esoteric conversation. No, no, no. This is about life and death for a lot of people. It's the way that they are able to get basic water supply or not. You know, um, you know. Another example. You know, if you look at the constituency projects, for example. These are constituency projects, you know, legislators and executive members and government people have promised that they are going to do this thing for their constituency. Okay? You are supposed to provide water for your people. Then you go and see that the water is not there. So working with our grantees, whether it is uh, Serap or Premium Times or, uh, you know, being, uh, the being Signature, to go to that community and say, okay, but where is the water that they say they're doing? That lack of water could lead to diarrhea, could lead to cholera, could lead to dysentery, could lead to even death of some people in our things. So, but how do we ensure uh, that, um, you know, uh, that water supply is there so that the community people can actually have more access to water that they can drink and see that they are there in the supplies and our things. And I can see that, you know, you are also a victim of Nepal now. Uh, your lights have gone up, I think, uh, and, and you can see, and, and and you know, and this could have, could this could happen in an uh, in during an operation. A woman could be going through labor, and she's going through operation, and the light may go up. And 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 what does that mean for the person who has been operated at that time? So for us, not like you know, when we work with, for example, the National Electricity Regulation Commission, okay or the association or the national association of electricity distributors about consumers right so that consumers are provided for those electricity things that they are supposed to provide so so we work with uh, for example benin disco uh, or abuja disco to ensure that ordinary citizens whose power supply are supposed to be supplied as supplied. They are not given estimated building or uh, billing or whatever they do. So we have done a lot of work with, for example, uh, Anet or Berlin Disco or Abuja Disco to ensure that consumers' problems and other things are resolved. Um, of course, you know we we, we support uh, people that many people may not like them. For example, Berkete family. Um, lots of people don't have you know they don't think they are doing a good thing, uh, but they do also a lot of good things. I, I think that there are a lot of ordinary citizens who are sent out of jobs, who have been molested, who have been uh, done all kinds of things that have been done, they're able to go in and check and find out and, and, and see that you know, those basic rights of citizens and other things are actually provided for, for what they do and other things. So for me, sometimes, you know, uh, there are the big things that we do. For example, you know, we support the ICPC and it does a lot of work around constituency project, recovery of funds, around asset recovery. We support EFCC and so they do all those kind of things and trying to make sure that people do not just take, get taken, run away and to support their effectiveness and other things. But I think sometimes the day-to-day -day ordinary citizens, how do they feel? And how do we support programs that actually touch on the basic life of people sometimes are more important in terms of the impact of the work that we do? It's really something. And like you said, I was just a, a, a victim of NEPA. And usually doing these um, live series, I have to actually prepare for NEPA while there's still light. So <laughs> to make sure that things keep flowing. But um, you all have done amazing work and working with, with an array of stakeholders to, to address it. Um, so now um, I'm just going to talk about one specific stakeholders that you've been, you've been working with, so, which is the civil society organization. So how have you empowered them um, and the government? Like how have you em 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 empowered them in this marriage together to address the cancer of corruption? Yeah, I think it's, I'm happy that you asked that question because from my own perspective, um, however good a government is, however righteous they are and other things, and whatever claim that they make about how good they are and others, we must support civil society groups and organizations to remind them, to hold them to account, to hold their leg on the fire so that they do not slack. That is even in the best of situations. 
And, and the same thing, civil society organizations and others have a role to play. And they can do all the yelling and naming and shaming and everything they can do that work. But our own theory of change is that it's only when government and civil society and the private sector come together and work together as a group, that is when change can happen. Because uh, civil society uh, cannot provide some of the services and the goods and other things that government can provide. And that's why they need government. They need to have a government that is a listening government, that is a responsive government, and that is an accountable government. So that when they make their own demands about certain things, or when they go to court and institute a public interest litigation, or they ask for, for, for freedom of information request from a government ministry as to what they want and others, then we know that that is one of their own contributions that they can make. But we also know that in order for us, for government to do that one, sometimes government people are not necessarily bad people, do not have the equipment, they don't have the knowledge, they don't have the capacity, to do the good things even when they want to do the good things so because of that one we also support government agencies and that's why for example you know we support a range of uh anti anti-corruption agencies from the icpc to the efcc to nfiu to skumal to code of conduct to tuga you know many many of them uh, that we support them electricity regulation commission uh, consumer protection council all of them we support them because we also want them to be supported to do the work that they want to do. Because sometimes, as I said, it's not that they are just bad people, no. But sometimes their own problem is that they don't have also the capacity, the equipment, and other things to do the work. So we think that this combination of the private sector, the public sector, and civil society coming and working together is the best way of how do we ensure that this is happen. Or, for example, you know, we support a lot of media organizations. Um, you know, we, you know, we put from the Premium Times to Daily Trust to Sahara Reporters to the Cable and many, many, many groups that we support. And sometimes, you know, actually, they even write things against the MacArthur Foundation, and and and, 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 and we say, okay, that's fine. Um, but but the, but the point is that you know you need the independent media to do the digging to do the investigation, to do the reporting, so that they can raise all those difficult questions. And they raise the even difficult questions against the MacArthur Foundation. And we will respond to them in the best that we can do in our things. So, but we also know that media organizations are not an advocacy group. So you mm -hmm. need civil society groups. So that today, for example, if, uh, let's say, uh, one of the media organizations come out with a story about look at what something has been done, so you need civil society groups to now take the story and do the advocacy work about them. Because for media, they are all breaking the news. They break the news and then they move to the next news. They break the news, then they make to the next news. But we need the civil society groups and say, okay, okay, this story that has been produced on A or B or C, how do we make sure that this story is not just dead today and then it just disappears? How do we continuously monitor it do advocacy about it and request that you know something should be done around that one. So that is the way in which we work uh, around the media and civil society groups as well. It, it, it's it's quite holistic. It just it just because and you know just as a as a member of civil society and and as a citizen, you know really watching how the work of the MacArthur Foundation, really working with the various stakeholders, it 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 shows. In the impact of the of the work that's being done, and now that we're hearing you talk about it, you know, on this on this forum, it, it, it's just very holistic. So that's uh, that's really something. So I'm gonna tell everybody if you have any questions, I, I have one question now. Keep them coming so that we can ask Dr. Kole uh, as soon as we're done with this discussion. So I'm waiting on your questions. All right. So um, Dr. Kole, I'm gonna go to the next question. Um, so. You've talked about working with government. You've talked about working with civil society. You've talked about working with media. Um, now, um, how has the government as a whole, because you've talked, you've worked with certain agencies that address corruption, but the government, it, you know, it's a big behemoth. 
<laughs> so how has it how has the government itself received uh the work that you all are doing in with uh, anti-corruption <laughs> well you know you know it's, it's very difficult to say but the only thing i'll just begin by saying is that when we started this work really Mm -hmm. um, the first actually request and encouragement we received was from the vice president, um, okay. who uh, some of us have supported him when he started Integrity. Uh, that was long, 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 many years ago. Uh, he was the founder of Integrity. And then uh, we supported him that time. And then, you know, he became the, um, the attorney general of Lego State. Um, we also supported him. So during the transition period, uh, he actually invited us and said, look, you know, you people have supported us when I was studying, when I said integrity and when I was in the ministry. And so now that I have now become the vice president, I'm looking forward to your support and how we can support our work. And so that was really our uh, conversation with him before even the um, swearing in, in him as a vice president and other things. So it was in that context, I think, that we tried to set up a fund um, uh, which primarily supported a lot of the work around government, especially the Presidential Advisory Committee Against Corruption. That was how uh, that work started, and we supported them and other things. I would say that um, I think that by and large, I believe that the government is is, is 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 very supportive i think um of course elements in the government are always uh, uh, unhappy because sometimes you know we support for example many of the media organizations many of the civil society organizations set up will take the president to court tomorrow they will take the vice president to court <laughs> the following day the, the, the sahara reporters will write something and then people will be very angry and say you know why are you why are you supporting sahara reporters or some you know premium times um they'll do all kinds of stories and then they'll say you know but Kole, i know why are you funding premium times and doing this kind of thing so i am sure that you know you know i i tell people that this thing comes with the territory and i always tell people in government that look you know we did not set out in order for anyone to investigate you um you know all we are interested in that you know and i think i also tell them that actually MacArthur also comes under pressure from these organizations you know mm. there are times that people you know think that why are you you know on many on one or two or three occasions some of the newspapers have written stories about us um but but that is it you know but that is how life is and other things um so I, I'm sure that there are elements of our work that people are very, very upset. There are elements that they really like, like when we support the feeding program, I think that you know people thought, oh, this is really good and nice work that you are doing and other things. Um, but when we support people who are investigating something and other things, I'm sure people are not happy about that one, but but that's how life is, yeah. Okay, okay. So it's pretty much, uh, um, you know, they, it's, it's kind of like a mixed bag, so. Um, okay, so um, now there was a
Sorry about that, everyone. Sorry about that, Dr. Kohli. The network is uh, was a bit epileptic there. <laughs> um, so, um, so we just wanted to ask one more, uh, another question. Now, there was a there was a periodical that I read that uh, MacArthur found uh, funded. I don't remember who the author is. It talked about peace and security and corruption and making those connections. So I just wanted to um, to ask you about that. So how has it affected our peace and security? You highlighted it earlier in our conversation, how corruption causes civil wars and certain issues. But can we just kind of, you know, have a conversation on the connection between corruption and the chronic insecurity we are having at the moment? Well, um, so, you know, when at the beginning of the program, MacArthur in 2014, um, one of the things that our leadership asked us was go and talk to people and find out what is it that really is more important for them, for them and the people in the county and other things. And uh, we said, okay, good. We went around and um, number one problem that everyone talked about was in 2014, not 2019, and maybe the same thing now, was insecurity. You know, people even then complain about insecurity. Wow. even then yes that, that was the number one issue that people talk about but i think part of the reason why at that time 2014 insecurity was big problem was just because at that time uh boko haram was the major headline uh, at that point you know so but our own point of view was okay yeah i think insecurity is critical and very important but i think part of the challenge that we have noticed especially following the transition and the various reports of some of the major newspapers and other things we have found out that a lot of the resources that have been given for fighting against boko haram uh, many of them ended in the pockets of individuals and yeah. and, individuals and individuals so 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 that is just one one one, one to show how um there is an industry that has developed about insecurity in our country and an industry that is feeding on the vulnerabilities of our people whereby the resources that are meant even to fight the insecurity itself uh by and large a lot of them have also ended up in the pockets of people and there are people who truly believe that that um that one of the reasons why many of the insecurity issues have lingered in our country is because there are people who are benefiting from the insecurity that is happening. There are governments and government officials and security officials and industries, contractors, um, and all kinds of people who are benefiting from the corruption that is going as a result of insecurity. And therefore, there is no appetite. There is no incentive. So the political economy of the insecurity is leading to perpetuate the insecurity because there are a lot of people who are benefiting from it. So corruption in one way that you can actually make a direct connection about insecurity is the fact that an industry has developed of suppliers, of contractors, of individuals who are manufacturers, of people who have developed so many things that, and you know, people talk of Meduguri as ATM. You know, mm. um, why do they build to become ATM? ATM because that's where you go and, you know, you make a lot of money and you put it in your pocket and, and that's the story. So that, that, is what, that is one expression of why I think that there is a significant relationship between uh, corruption and institutes in our country. But as I said also earlier, when you look at insecurity in our country, a lot of it is not like a question of arms. It's not about buying arms and appointing major generals and others. You know, I, I try to tell people that if I was the president of Nigeria, I would not appoint my national security advisor to be a, a major general or someone from the military. No. Nigeria's problem is embedded in a, a social economic political, ethnic issues. We are not fighting another country. 
Mm-hmm. Yes, Boko Haram is probably um, one where, where you may need some security and other No. But these are deep historical, social, economic, political issues that are leading to a lot of the insecurity in our country. And therefore, the people that you need to deal with those problems are people who understand society, appreciate society, have a historical context and knowledge, so that you just don't send a battalion to uh, Zampara and then say, okay, go and, and kill them. That will not, that, that will, yes, that will help, but that will not solve the problem. So you also need an, an approach that understands the context, the issues, the flares, and others. And this is not going to be done by military people because they don't, they really don't, that is not their job. The military people, their job is to go and kill people. We, we, we train our ability to, not to go and understand and solve problems. Now. So for me, I think that in order for us to see some of the connections about insecurity and lack of peace uh, as a result of the challenges and the issues that have alienated a lot of our people. And part of that alienation is because of the fact that you know, the resources and the decision makings and other things have been done in a way that do not actually support the local common people in our society. Now, let me make it clear that yes, I support um, uh, the military involvement in situations, some situations, but I don't think that that is only solution that we should be thinking about because we need to understand how this problem started, what is the historical context of those problems, and the military unfortunately are not equipped to understand, analyze any of those kind of problems that we are seeing. So for me, I think that the issue of you know how corruption affects our own people and leads to insecurity in the country and the lack of peace in the country is very, very critical and very, very important because we can see how and why are these challenges of um, these challenges of insecurity are tied to the corrupt practices that are happening in our country and our people. And 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 as I said, you know, just take simple example like education. You know, the children of the rich go to the best private schools in this our country. They finish, then they get jobs. They don't have to even finish. They are getting jobs in NNPC, in CBN, in all the choice places and things. The children of the poor, first of all, they go to a public school, a public school that even goats probably would not even want to be inside those buildings. They finish, they don't have any skill, they don't have any education. When they apply for for a job, they will stay for five years, six years, seven years in order to do them. It will take a lot of effort for us to stop them from engaging in anything that they think is necessary for them to survive. So unless we actually deal with those issues that actually contribute towards the challenges of insecurity and other things, and corruption is one of the major reasons why this has happened, then you know we have a very long way to go. This is a, a really, a really interesting, um, 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 you know, angle that you 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 use in terms of how co- corruption affects um, peace and security, and making sure that it's it's a social scientist that should advise the president, not necessarily like a military person, so that there is a way to look at things more holistically in terms of peace and security. So I'm just gonna go back to. Um, what the foundation strategy is, and then I'll go to questions and uh, comments from the audience. So um, now that, so in terms of addressing uh, corruption in Nigeria, what do you feel like, is it part, how does it uh, feed into the foundation's long-term strategy for Nigeria and Africa? Well, um, as you know, uh, foundations like ours and many organ- development organizations, we always have cycles. You know, we have uh, uh, some three-year cycle, some five-year cycle. So I think that at the moment, I think that, you know, we started this work um, in 2015. Um, we had the first, um, first three years and we had an evaluation. Uh, and now we are on the second phase of the work, uh, which is going to end in 2024. Uh, and so that is the, the commitment that we have in terms of the work that we are doing around uh, around this. Um, then from 2024, we may come back with another strategy, uh, which may be 
be one piece of the, the of the current work that we are doing it may be something different and but we don't know at this point what it might look like um but i think that what we want to do is you know how do we um how do we institutionalize how do we support groups and organizations so that they can continue to do this work whether we are here or not and uh, and so what we have been trying to do is you know uh, institutionalize the civil society groups and organizations you know so support them so that their organizations are much much more better than where we found them uh, they are able to do a lot of the work that we do so uh, makata is about money but really not money is just one part of the thing that we do you know we try to um, improve their skills, improve their knowledge, improve the processes of these organizations so that they are able to do whatever they can do, whether MacArthur today is available or not. We try to support groups, local groups in Nigeria. I think that 98% of the organizations that we support are all Nigerian organizations because MacArthur may be here today, it may not be here tomorrow. But Nigerians will be in Nigeria. <laughs> they don't have any option exactly. but to be in Nigeria. Sure. And therefore, our commitment is, you know, how do we support Nigerian organizations so that they will be here, whether MacArthur is here or not, MacArthur is not there, or whichever other organization is here. And that because at the end of the day, it is our own country, it is our own people. We don't have choices of running away. Even, even if 10% of us run away, we still have 200 million or so of Nigerians who have to be in Nigeria because they don't have any choice in our thing. So I think that the strategy of the foundation is really based on how do you leave organizations behind? Whatever the strategy is, whatever they are going to do, they are better than what we have found them. Okay. Okay, that's that's really good, um, um, Dr. Kole, because um, just observing with civil society organizations around the country, not the ones, not even the ones in the city, actually the ones in the rural areas, you, you see about the founders full of passion. And then you, you know, in terms of increasing their institutional capacity so that they can do more for national development. So, which is a that's that's a really strategic way to go as a foundation. Um, so I'm going to go into to the audience. I have a question here from um, Joy Gabby. She says, "Please, how do the how do the MacArthur Foundation intend to implement?" the last mentioned strategy. So she talked about question two. So let me look at what question two. I said, um, what, what made MacArthur Foundation include anti-corruption as part of their strategy? So uh, how does the foundation intend to implement, implement the strategy of anti-corruption? I think he, you answered that already, and um, Joy, in terms, of your, in, in terms of implementation of the strategy. But do you want to just kind of uh, yes. Highlights. Yes. So I think, yes, I can I can highlight uh, some few things. So uh, when we started the work, um, at the moment we try to do four things. Um, first of all, we said, okay, let's support investigative journalism, okay, and because we think that we need government, uh, we need independent media. We need to support independent media to do the kind of investigation that are required in our country. Because an independent media can only be possible also if there is some sense of independence of finance. Because one of the major problems of our media is the fact that they don't have the resources to do the work that they want to do. So they are compromised by uh, advertisers, they are compromised by people who give them money, and therefore they try to shut down stories. So we thought that, that investigative journalism is one of the strategies. And to do investigative journalism, it requires money. And that money is important for editorial independence. So we give a lot of support to various media organizations. But even when we are doing the investigative journalism, we also said, okay, why don't we do it in our Nigerian local languages? Because um, yes, there are many of us who understand and speak English language, but we also need to, one, actually support our local languages so that they don't just die off. Because many of us who's, uh, who are based in Lagos and... So for us, supporting the local language investigation is a way of also pro promoting the development and preservation of our local language. So we support investigative journalism about, I don't know, 10 Nigerian languages as well. So that is one component of the strategy around investigative journalism. The second part of it is around behavioral change. 
we know that law and order is important but at the end of the day is the behavior of our people which is also very critical and very important so how do we go about that one one way to do is is to support some of the nollywood kind of uh, films that have been produced. You know, how does it influence our people? So if you watch, for example, Jennifer Diary, you know, uh, you know, uh, many people watch Jennifer Diary. But how do we use humor in order to talk about corruption in a way that is not say, oh, stop corruption, stop corruption, stop corruption. That one doesn't doesn't do anything. Doesn't change anything. But how do you use it subtly in order to uh, convey the message around anti-corruption and other things? Or um, so, so Nollywood kind of uh, be able to change, but also we talk about also faith, because every Nigerian uh, or many Nigerians, let me so not, let me yes, but ninety percent of Nigerians believe in something. Uh, at least they believe in God. Uh, whatever they call them in different ways is a different matter. So we are saying that okay, but if ninety percent of us actually believe in God, what does our faith says about opening a meeting with opening uh, with the opening prayer? Closing with a closing prayer, but in between those meetings, you write checks and then put in your pocket. Does it does it make sense? Does it make sense? You know, so th there must be something about our faith that should tell us what is right and what is wrong. So we said, okay, why don't we try to work with our faith leaders as part of this our behavioral change? So that is the second component about behavioral change. The third uh, approach that we are using is around the criminal justice system, which is which is complementing the behavioral change, which is means that if you are found corrupt, then you have to fear for it. You have to go for, you have to be jailed because that is what you deserve in nothing. But as we know, our system is rigged in favor of the rich and the powerful because the rich and the powerful will go and hire 60 sons. They will come and intimidate this magistrate who have just paid school and and, and 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 that is the end of the case you see all call cases you see governors who have you know become governors so uh, then the next thing that they become senators uh, and then the next one is the go, go, go governors so that you know they escape the system by ensuring that they have the resources into other intimidate or the judges to endure and intimidate but also you know we also have to talk about the fact that even our own judge judicial system have become so significantly compromised because that you can read some judgments you don't even understand how can any judge can give this kind of judgment or you see contradictory judgments from one uh so you procure your judge you know you go to port Harcourt, you procure one then you go to my degree then the other one will give them so they give all kinds of contradictory judgments so that you know you can escape from so criminal justice system is one the, the third approach. The fourth approach that we're using is around civil society, support for civil society groups and organizations. So these are the um, the headers, the seraphs, um, the APRIC mills. Some of them are working on 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 uh, on, 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 on 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 freedom of information. Some of them are working on whistleblower policy. Some of them are doing public interest litigation. Some of them are just naming and yelling and shelling to be on the newspaper, syslack, and talk about everything. And so those are the four basic strategies that we use in order to do the work that we are doing. Investigative journalism, behavioral change, criminal justice system, and then support for civil society, which we call joint body. I think in our language we call the civil society as joint body, pulling together, coming together for the better good of the country. Okay. Thank you so much, Joy. Uh, I'm sure he answered your question uh, extensively. So, um, so what we're going to do now, with I don't want to take up uh, too much more of your time, um, Dr. Colin. So we're just going to get your final thoughts. Well, my final thoughts are that, um, you know, the issue of corruption is a life and death matter, really, at the end of the day. Because, you know, you're thinking about you wake up in the morning, you know, you know, you want even just have water to drink, you know, uh, you want to have water to cook, you know, you want to have electricity, you know, you know, you want to drive from home to where you're going, you want to walk. You know, you want to take your children to school, but then you see roadblocks in your life. 
you see all the obstacles that are put on your path. Sometimes, yes, government may not have the resources, but sometimes government has given the resources that when I wake up, there is water that I can brush my teeth, I can clean, wash my face. I don't have to spend four hours, five hours trying to draw water from the well in order for me to drink. If I'm going to draw water from the well for four or five hours, why would my children go to school? Why? No, I, I would need them to help me to go and draw that water from that rather than sending them to school. If I don't send them to children to school, they are essentially rising or uh, growing up essentially as illiterates. Or even if they are able to go to the school, they are going to the village school where government has awarded contract for construction of building. Government has employed teachers. But the sad reality is that the, 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 the building is not done. The teacher who is supposed to be there is a teacher that have gone to a school that also cannot even write uh, write his or her name. Well, you may, I think maybe he may the teacher may write his or her name, but cannot write correct sentence or you know one correct sentence or one paragraph that teacher cannot write. Okay, now then that is the one that is going to teach my children to go and become somebody. They can never become somebody in this country. And we cannot allow that gross inequality in our society to continue. Because these young people that are going to come out of this system who know that they can never get a job from government because we'll, sit, we'll write the exams, they will never pass the exams. If they, if they manage to go to jam, they have never seen a computer. Mm. Jam is saying, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, we are now going to, uh, every exam is going to do on, on computer and other things. Mm. <laughs> Automatically, these children will never pass the jam. Not because they don't know anything, but because they, their parents them, 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 have never seen a computer. And then you ask them to write exam on computer. Hello? They will not pass. They will not pass. And so, and then the children of the rich and others who have stolen money or taken money, the others have been deprived of the computer that should have gone to their own school so they can learn something and, and be able to compete. We have already rigged the system against them. We have already rigged the system against them. These people are going to be very, very angry with us. Mm -hmm. That is why we cannot sleep. That's why you cannot sleep. So you see expression of these problems, you know, we, you know, you you hear about uh, you know uh, IPOP in the southeast. You hear about uh, OPC in this uh, in the southwest. You hear of the Niger Delta militants. You hear about uh, complex all over the country. And these complex are done by young people. There's nobody who is as of my own age who is involved in this conflict. These are young people, people who have lost hope. They see their governors who cannot provide them the basic things that they are supposed to be provided for, they become very angry. And they express their anger in different ways. In some ways, it can be IFOP. In some ways, it can be um, some elements of Boko Haram. In some cases, it can be a little banditry and other things that is happening all across the country. People are expressing their own anger against a system that is so corrupt, that is rigged against them, and therefore they will do anything and everything in order to bring down this house. And this house is falling down. And unless we see the big connection between what our governors are doing, you know, we spend actually a lot of time talking about Abuja, but the governors and others who also control significant resources in our country are never held accountable for all those. Yeah. Some of those governors have become demigods. They just do whatever they want to do and then get away with it. Nobody holds them accountable because they believe they are, they are, they are the lords, they are the, they, are, they are the gods in their own society and other things as well. So I, I think that, um, for me, I think that the issue of tackling with the issue of corruption, um, corruption in terms of money, but also in terms of, you know, corruption, what is corruption? Is the, is the use of power for personal gain. Because I am somebody, therefore, whether in terms of admission, whether in terms of jobs, whether in terms of 
sexual fables that we use against women, whatever tells the within is about use of power for personal gain. And many of our people are abusing our power that we have in order to enrich ourselves, our families, our generation, at the expense of the 99.9% .9 of Nigerians. That is that you you really you really tied it up with table. I saw I just saw this comment here um, by um, Mrs. Tina Inahuru Ahilia. She says Nigerians are usually a hopeful people, but the political class is eroding this hope. No consequences and accountability, yeah. which is really uh, uh, which is really something. So again, thank you so much, um, Dr. Kole, for um for this insight that you've brought to us um from not only from your professional experience but the great work that um you have done you know with the helm of affairs with uh, the macarthur foundation dealing with a complex array of stakeholders to address this cancer um, of corruption um, in our society so again sir thank you so much i salute i like i i said um when i first spoke I said that uh, you have mentored so many uh, uh, civil society and um, leaders across all strata. I said, I'm, I'm at the back of the line. I'm joining. <laughs> I'm joining the back of the line. All these yeah, you have jumped forward, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so again, again, thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for your time. Thank you very much for having me as well. Thank you very much. All right, sir. Take thank care. Thank you. Bye. All right, then. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. So you guys heard it um, with um, Dr. Kole Shetima, who is the uh, director of the MacArthur Foundation in Africa. I hope you enjoyed the session on the fight against corruption. So just a quick announcement. Um, so I am, he is one of the array of stakeholders that we're speaking to on Dev Sector Series um, in terms of what they are doing to change the world. So. Our next guest was still confirming with him. I'm going to be talking to a celebrity rapper, Ill Bliss, who is one of the characters of King of Boys. Um, I don't know if you've seen the, the, the banners in Lagos. They've not come down to Abuja, maybe in other parts of the country. Labulu is back. Look, guys, I love that movie. So um, I'll be so thrilled to get um, one of the cast members but he's just going to be talking about a bit about his career and how he's using his platform to maximize social impact. You know, what are the, some of the social causes he does to um, and uses his platform to highlight. So you do not want to miss this. In addition to that, the Social Impact Masterclass e-learning beta launch um, Facebook group um, is on and the beta launch is going to be online in a couple of weeks. I've gone live on Facebook and LinkedIn. Please visit the Social Impact Masterclass Facebook group. I am closing out the group this Friday, okay? So it's not going to be uh, an open private book um, group for much longer. In addition to that, um, I'm also going to be um, having articles on the Dev Sector series uh, with each of our guests. I did a long form article on a Dev Sector series um, from last year to this point. So my first one is the one um, I conducted last week with Mr. Yebishi um, Uluashi, I mean Ulusheyi, the um, the executive director of NNNGO. So I will be posting that on today. So just um, you know, be on the lookout for that. So again, guys, please like and share this video. Again, I salute all of you who, can, who are up here live with me and those who are going to be watching afterwards. So like and share this video, and I will see you next week. Let's change the world together.